our passage this morning that we're looking at is in John. This is part of the last conversation that Jesus has with his disciples in that upper room. He is just hours from going to the cross. And they're, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, they are beside themselves. They know something's up. And so he's giving them words of encouragement. And this is what he says. When the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. You also will testify because you've been with me from the beginning. I've told you these things to keep you from stumbling. They will ban you from the synagogues. In fact, time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering service to God. They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. But I've told you these things so that when their time comes, you will remember I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because well, I was with you. But now I'm going away to him who sent me. Not one of you asked me, where are you going yet? Because I've spoken these things to you. Sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is your benefit, it's for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because they don't believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own, but He will speak whatever He hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me, because He will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that He takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. A few years ago in England, there were a couple of retired friends. They took off from an airport in a small plane. In fact, it was this one right here. They spent the day flying uh, to the coast. They flew along the east coast of England along the North Sea in the daylight. They landed the plane for lunch. And then around dinner time, they decided they'd head home. They get in the plane and they take off and they're headed back home. Along the way, the pilot began to feel ill. So ill, in fact, that he became incapacitated, and it fell to John Wilde, who had never flown a plane before to land the plane. Now, Roy Murray was a flight instructor who'd gone home for the day. He gets a phone call at home around dinner time, and there is, uh, there's an emergency. We need you back at the airport. Come to the flight control tower. And that's what he does. He arrives, he finds out his, his job to provide John Wilde the instructions to get that plane down safely. And over the next hour, that's exactly what Murray does with John Wilde. Along with the information that he is providing Wilde, he is also providing comfort and assurance that landing the plane is possible, that we are going to do this. We're going to do it together. He encouraged Wildy to keep calm. Don't over-control the plane. He also said this, do not watch those instruments. Take your eyes off the instruments. You just listen to my voice. I am going to get you down. And with those words of assurance and keeping the plan simple, Murray was able to talk Wilde, who had never flown a plane in his life, down to the ground safely. In that moment, Wilde had nothing to go with except the assuring voice of someone who is telling him, don't look at the instruments. You listen to my voice. I will get you up. And that's exactly what happened. What is it 
or who is it that needs to get us home? Whose voice are we listening to? What keeps us calm? Who gives us comfort when life is on the line? How do we get through anything in life? Well, to get this answer, we turn to this last conversation that Jesus is having with his best friends before he heads to the, to the cross. These are his fina, final hours. The disciples are unnerved. I mean, they're asking, they are asking questions. They want to know, well, where are you going? Uh, can we go with you? Can we come along? They want to know, can we go see the Father? You talk about going to see the Father. And of course Jesus is going to see his Father. That's where he came from. He misses Father. He's, he's supposed to be there. He's supposed to be with his Father. And Jesus says, no, where I'm going, you cannot come because <laughs> going to the Father means going through the cross. Where I'm going, you cannot come home and he is headed to prepare a dwelling place with the father and that was a running theme through all the old testament began in the garden the god's desire is to dwell with man to dwell among men to have communion 101 and we we messed that up jesus is going to the father he is going to prepare that dwelling place that has been promised all along where I'm going, you cannot come. Instead, though, he's got words of comfort. The funny thing is, the disciples are not feeling it. <laughs> and Jesus knows it. So this last part of Jesus' conversation with his best friends in that room that night is all about peace. It's all about assurance. It's all about comfort. It doesn't mean that there aren't some tough times ahead. In fact, (laughs) I don't know if you caught it. Almost, he says it so matter-of-factly, I'm sure some of them were, were sitting like, what did he just say? He actually says, when they kill you, they believe they're going to be helping out God. And, and, and if you're sitting there, you're like, uh, first of all, who's they? When's when? Kill? <laughs> when they kill you? When they kill you, they, they, uh, what? (laughs) That doesn't feel reassuring. But the heart and core of what Jesus tells them is that even though he is leaving, he's sending a replacement, a comforter, a counselor, an advocate, somebody who is always for them. The amazing thing about Jesus leaving is this one who is coming, this comforter. And you know what he's doing? This passage tells us he's always talking about Jesus. Jesus may be leaving them, may be leaving their visible presence, but he is sending someone to them that's always going to be talking about Jesus, testifying about Jesus. They're afraid of losing Jesus, and Jesus is saying, that's not going to happen. You're not going to lose me, and I am not going to lose you. They will have a comforter, and this comforter is the Holy Spirit. We have moved to the final section of the Apostles' Creed, and it's in this section where we're spending the next few weeks. We began this journey at the beginning of the year. Now we're here. And we're talking about the Spirit today in the third section. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We recited this moments ago. I believe in the Holy Spirit. In fact, the entire Apostles' Creed, if we were going to boil it down to one sentence, it would be this. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ, His Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, three three sentences. (laughs) That's the Creed. That's what we confess. We confess the triune God every time we confess our faith in Jesus using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It all comes down to this. All three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, are all working and have worked for our salvation. And so we confess our faith in that, though. 
it raises the question, who's the Holy Spirit? It's hard to believe that many get this wrong. Five years ago, LifeWay Research uh, was asking people uh, questions about the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 56% of those American evangelicals, Christians, here in the United States, think the Holy Spirit is a force. 50, more than half the people here in the United States believe that the Holy Spirit is a force, not a personal being. 28% say the Spirit's a divine being, but not equal to God the Father or God the Son. It's hard to believe, hard to believe that uh, America considers itself a Christian nation. The Holy Spirit a force. This is not how the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit not as some kind of extension of God or manifestation of God or some kind of uh, impersonal force or impersonal energy or influence. Not some sort of heavenly spirit that has a fancy title. Holy Spirit's not just another manifestation of God. And people talk about him that way. Here's what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is as much person as God the Father. He is as much person as God the Son. He has a personality. So he's not an it. I've heard that a few times. Spirit is not an it. It's a he. Just like God the Father is a he, God the Son is a he, the Holy Spirit is he. In fact, our passage uses that pronoun. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's a person. When we talk about the Spirit, we're talking about a someone. So it's why we say we worship God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons in one. Now, you know the moment you say that, you know, all sorts of questions arise. Because we can't wrap our heads around it. Right? And like the rest of church history, we don't try. And I know there, again, you get on the internet and there are all sorts of analogies out there about how to try and explain the Trinity. How this works. You know, every single one of those analogies has a problem with it at some long way. At some point you end up denying something that's true about the Holy Spirit or Jesus in the Bible. This doesn't work. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a person. So what does the Holy Spirit do now? The moment we say, what does the Holy Spirit do? We could spend the next hours talking, and we're not going to unpack everything that the Spirit does this morning. It would take way too long. In fact, I was thinking maybe at some point in the, in the coming year or so, we will maybe unpack that for us because there's so many misconceptions and misunderstandings of what the, what the Spirit is doing. But in order to begin this answer, we're going to start with the creed since that's where we're at. We're going to answer the way the creed does. And here's the way the creed answers it. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And remember, we've, all, we've again said that all of these things come straight out of the Bible. This is simply a summary of what the Bible is saying. Now, we read this and we confess this, and I'll, I'll be the first person that... That, that does this uh, absentmindedly, but when we say I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian, that looks like a bullet point list, right? We're used to PowerPoint. And so we read that as a bullet point list. Like, well, I believe in the Spirit. I believe in the church. Actually, that first line, that's a summary statement. The rest is what the Spirit is doing for us. We need to see that when we confess that we believe in the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit that has placed us into the Holy Christian Church. It is the Holy Spirit that has given us this community, this communion of saints. It's the Holy Spirit who is applying to us Christ's forgiveness of our sins. It's the Holy Spirit who is regenerating us and giving us life. And it is the Holy Spirit, just like God breathed life into men and breathes life into sinners. He is going to bring, breathe life through the Spirit into us. 
on that last day. The Holy Spirit is the breath of life. That's a running theme throughout Scripture as well. You see what the Holy Spirit's doing through all of this is that the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the gospel. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes, gives us the faith to embrace the gospel and saves us. One of Martin Luther's most famous quotes is in his explanation of the catechism. We're going to read the whole thing. But he says this, I believe that by my own reason or powers, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. By my own reason or powers. But instead, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel enlightened me with his gifts, made me holy, kept me in the true faith, just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and makes holy the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one common truth. Not by my own reason or powers that I've come to embrace Jesus. It's because the Holy Spirit has been working on me, has been giving me life, has been providing me the forgiveness, has been providing me with the eyes to see and the faith to believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's the Spirit that brings us into the Gospel. And this is the big point that Jesus is making with his best friends, the disciples, that day, that evening, in that upper room. They are fearful. They don't know what's going on. They, have, <laughs> they are so clueless, they have a traitor in their midst, and they don't even know that they have a traitor in their midst. And Jesus really is. He's going to make good on his promise. He's been talking to them for weeks leading up to this. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again in three days, but I'm going to go die. He's on his way to see his father like he wants to do. And he's doing this all for them. He knows their faith is weak. He knows they are bound to forget. And so he knows with their faith being weak, weak and then being forgetful, this is his promise to them, or this is what he says over and over again. We're not going to read all these. But all of this occurs in this passage 11 times. He's talking about, I have told, I've told you these things. I've been telling them to you. He says, I didn't tell you these things because of this. I'm telling you the truth. I still have many things to tell you. But then he says, the Spirit will speak. There's a shift. It's all about what Jesus has been telling them and providing them in his word, the comfort and peace that comes with the gospel. So that when they face what's coming and what's coming in the next few hours is going to blow their minds, it's going to terrify them. In those moments, he's going to use, he's going to use his spirit. He's going to have the spirit remind them of things. In fact, Later, as we read the text, it will even say, and oh, by the way, the disciples remembered that at this moment, Jesus said something about what was going to occur. This is his promise to them. I've told you these things. The Holy Spirit is going to make sure that what Jesus has told us, we hear again and again and again, why? Because Jesus himself is rest. Jesus himself is our peace. Jesus himself is our comfort. And how do we remember that? Because the Spirit is bringing it to our remembrance. The Spirit is bringing what Jesus said about peace, bringing comfort to us. The Holy Spirit is the one who is securing our salvation for us. Jesus goes to the cross and wins it. The Holy Spirit then applies it to sinners like you and me. You see, the Holy Spirit is always creating faith in us to believe the promises of Jesus. When Jesus tells us something, the Holy Spirit is right there with us and with Jesus saying, yes, what Jesus is saying is true. Here, believe it. And we do. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing for us in our weak faith. He is constantly doing his work of life renewal in us. And that brings us to another myth that we have today. 
in some circles leaving church today, I hope it's not here, but <laughs> you will hear people in their cars. I've heard this for years. On their way home from church, they say, wow, I was really convicted by the Spirit. That was a real gut punch. Listen, there is no hope in that statement. There's no comfort in that statement. There's no peace in that statement. The Holy Spirit provides you with comfort and peace and rest. The conviction you're feeling, oh, it's there. That's being provided by the law. God's commands. But we're designed to, to remind us of who we are. It's the law that remind God's commands. It's the, God's law that reminds us that we are guilty, that we don't measure up. You know, the Spirit may use that law as He is creating faith in us to bring us to Christ. But that's not the Spirit's responsibility. That's not what He does. That's the law. And oh, by the way, there's only one person in the Bible that is called the accuser. And it's not the Spirit. The only person in the Bible that is called the accuser, the accuser of the brethren, is Satan himself. That's not the role of the Spirit. The role of the Spirit, again, as the law comes... And as the serpent is whispering in our ears, you filthy, rotten, no good sinners. The Spirit comes along and reminds us, no. Yes, you're a filthy, rotten sinner, but no, you are forgiven. You are accepted. Jesus has already finished and completed his work of salvation for you. You are his, and he will never let you go. That is the spirit working on you in that moment. That's why some of you, I've said, that, and again, I hear the fears. I have to do this to myself. In those moments where I am thinking, God has abandoned me, we have to remind ourselves, no, that is not, that's not the Bible, that's not the Bible talking, that is the serpent talking. That's the law talking. And you need to listen to Jesus. And the Spirit reminds us you are forgiven. You are God's child. He always, always, always has you. That brings us to the final question. How does the Spirit do what He does? And it's actually here again. We <laughs> Remember this list? I've told you these things. I've told you these things. I still have many things to say. The Spirit will declare what I told you. Uh, he'll declare it to you. It's right here. What I told you. The Word. The Spirit's always using the Word. The Word and the Spirit are inseparable. The Holy Spirit throughout Scripture is providing rest and peace and comfort and he is doing it through the word this is how he creates faith in us this is how he causes us to believe the gospel it's through the preaching of the word through the table that we have here and Jesus says I've told you these things he's talking about his word the word that he has revealed to them the word that he's going to give them in fact Many of them that are listening to this are then going to sit down and write. Matthew's sitting there in that room. We got, the, we got his letter, the letter of Matthew. John's sitting in this room. John wrote five books, five letters that we have in our Bible. He gives them his word. These things that I've told you. I'm giving you my spirit to bring these things to your remembrance so that others, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, billions, can hear my voice and hear my word through the Spirit. The Spirit does His work in our lives not as an impersonal force on the inside. You see, we can always be talking about, hey, this is what's going on in here. He is constantly using the word out here, the external word, to move into our lives and move into our hearts and work on our hearts to believe what Jesus has said to be true.
And it's through the scriptures. It's through the word in water or baptism that the spirit operates, giving us life, giving us forgiveness, giving us faith to believe in Jesus. It's through the Bible that the spirit gives us life and salvation and rest. That's why we're always, always, always talking about the Word. You know, the writer Hebrews says the Word is living and active. Well, how can he say that? Because, first of all, Christ is living and active. And secondly, the Spirit who uses the Word is living and active among us. This, thing, this, this Bible is alive. This is not a dead letter from God to us. This is our power for living. For giving us hope, for giving us peace, for giving us our salvation. And it's the Spirit who is bringing this and implying this to us and reminding us that what is here is true. One of the fascinating things about the expansion of the gospel as, as it explodes across uh, the Middle East and Eurasia, and when Christ goes into the heavens. As you read what Luke is saying throughout the book of Acts, time and again, he says the word is increasing. The good news about Jesus is increasing all over the place, all over the world. And just about every time he says that, the very next thing he says is, oh, the Spirit is operating here and doing this with the word. It's the word. It's the word and the Spirit. Inseparable. Why is this our hope here for Los Fresnos? It's because the Spirit takes this and moves into the lives of people who are fearful and tired and weary and says, this is true. Creates faith. This is to be believed and can be believed. It gives us life and hope to believe it. You know the difference between what the Holy Spirit does in our life and what Roy Murray did for John Wilde that day? And again, this is another misperception about the way the Spirit works. We typically have this, this view of the Spirit, and even though we can even start to think this is true about the way we are saved and forgiven. You know, in order for that plane to come down, John Wilde still had to contribute to the equation. He was still listening. He was still operating the controls. You know what the Bible says about the Spirit's work? The Spirit is both the flight instructor in the flight control tower and He is the pilot of the plane. And our lives are safe. And we land safely at home when we simply receive what the Spirit and what Jesus is doing for us on our behalf, we receive it in faith. Yes, there's no way I'm cooperating with this. You're going to have to land this plane. You're going to have to safely get me home. That's what Jesus and the Spirit do. Because if it's up to us, if it's up to our cooperation even, we crash the plane. That's what the Bible says. the only way is to have this implicit faith and implicit trust and belief and say no it's all you it's all you you're, you're in the controls and you receive what Jesus has done for us his forgiveness his life his salvation there's nothing for us to do except receive what Christ has done for us in faith Jesus always, always has us because His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, a person, is working to make sure that that happens. He is the guarantee, the Bible says, that Jesus always has us. Let's pray.